Good evening, everybody, or, or actually it could be good afternoon uh, or good evening. I think some of our uh, US colleagues might be tuning in as well. And um, welcome to the Dysautonomia Disconnect, how optimizing vagal tone can improve your patient's health by Dr. Eric Rees. Uh, normally you have the lovely Vanessa uh, introducing our guests, but she is busy traveling. So unfortunately you're stuck with me. Um, some of you, I think, may know me. My name's Simon Ramshaw. I'm the managing director of Aconia Lasers across in Europe, the Middle East, and Africa. Uh, we're a subsidiary of um, Aconia Corporation, which is where the lasers are manufactured over in sunny Florida in the US. So welcome to the event. Before I introduce you to uh, Dr. Eric, I'd like to just give you a little bit of information about Eric's um, experience and where he's come from. Some of you, I think, were already on his previous uh, uh, webinar, so you know, but uh, Dr. Eric is a doctor of chiropractic medicine and board certified chiropractic neurologist at the Neural Connection in Minneapolis. He received his doctorate in chiropractic from Northwestern Health Sciences University, graduating with a magna cum laude in honors. He currently holds a diplomat in functional neurology from the American Chiropractic Neurology Board and has completed thousands of hours of additional postgraduate coursework utilizing clinical application and therapeutic interventions in the neurological and nutritional rehabilitation of traumatic brain injuries, concussion, and vestibular disorders through the Carrick Institute of Clinical Neuroscience. As you can probably tell from that, I'm not a medical person, I'm a commercial person, so some words I have a little bit of difficulty with if I try to say them too fast, so apologies about that. Um, you probably have all been on these webinars before. If you notice down the right-hand side, um, we've got a questions and chat box. By all means, ask questions. Uh, I will keep a track of these questions and we'll fire them over to Dr. Eric at the end of his presentation. Uh, hopefully you should all be able to see us both um, with also the presentation underneath. And I will zone out and immediately hand you over to Dr. Eric. Welcome, Eric, and thank you very much for your time. Well, Simon, I will say you did a very good job pronouncing the, the introduction <laughs> of the bio. So uh, all that that means is I think I need to update it and edit that. So um, I do appreciate that introduction. And I appreciate um, those of you who are joining us today, whether you're live or whether you are watching this afterwards. Um, uh, today, I am really looking forward to talking about this. This is something that I'm really passionate about. Um, not only clinically with patients, but I also am really intrigued by the medical model, um, what they're currently doing in the neuromodulation space with vagal nerve stimulation, um, and what the future of this really looks like. So for those of you who work with a lot of trauma, a lot of concussions, brain injuries, or just people in general, I mean, I think every every single individual that you're going to encounter can benefit from understanding this information from you knowing how to clinically apply some of the information we're going to talk about today because this this doesn't just deal with trauma although this is kind of the main you know focus of the lecture um, it also deals with uh, you know chronic infections um, dealing with chronic inflammatory conditions like rheumatoid arthritis autoimmune conditions uh, different types of neuroinflammatory uh, aspects as well um, there are a lot of conditions that this really overlaps and fully encompasses so uh, what I what I really want to do is I want to focus on some of the finer details and then talk about the clinical applications of this as well. But as Simon had mentioned, we're really gonna talk about dysautonomia. And, and that's kind of a, a broad general term being used. And what that essentially means is it's, it's dysfunction of the autonomic nervous system. Well, what is that? What does that comprise? And then more importantly, uh, how can you go about and improve your autonomic function, not only for yourself, but for your patients? So uh, as we go through today, uh, we get our little agenda here. We'll talk about the, the balance and the interplay between the sympathetic and parasympathetic systems aka the autonomic systems. Uh, we'll talk about um, the vagus nerve specifically and its role in our overall health. Uh, for the most part, I'm gonna make the generalized statement that most people are sympathetic dominant. Um, but what I would what I'd argue with you uh, is, is that a lot of people are really uh, deficient in vagal function. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in detail. We'll talk about how changes in autonomic function affect both the brain and the body. It also affects the immune system, your ability to uh, control inflammation. We'll share some relevant research about the gut-brain connection, how this implicates the, the, the autonomic nervous system, 
And then we'll start talking about some mechanisms with low-level laser and how low-level laser can affect these different mechanisms, how it can upregulate different systems and how it can help really balance out your autonomic nervous system. And then we'll give a really big general overview about uh, the neuroinflammatory cascade and once again, how low-level laser can impact inflammatory processes. So um, once again, Simon's gonna keep me honest on the chat and let me know where questions are at. So uh, if there are questions that are being asked specifically, Simon, please, interrupt me if you, if, you, um, if you get a question so I can go and address it right away, because I'm sure this is just how it is, that when somebody has a question uh, and they're brave enough to put it out there, I'm sure other people have the same question as well. So um, I think that I would like to be this, have this be a give and take with regards to that. So uh, let's, let's no get problem. down to business. Let's, let's talk about uh, the autonomic nervous system, because I think that uh, you know, this is a term that we use generally in the medical system. And, and when we're talking about general health and wellness, but not many people really fully understand it. So the autonomic nervous system really describes both the central uh, networks and then the complex uh, automated neurological processes that occur not only throughout the brain and body, but even with regards to like vascularity and organs. So, you know, this, this involves the cerebral cortex, right? The insular cortex and the medial prefrontal regions. And, and we actually didn't think that this was a part of the system until very recently. And I'll say recently within the last couple of decades. Because uh, you know, all of us possess the ability today to go ahead and think about our breath, right? So all this movement towards breath work and and taking, you know, cold baths, things like that. What does that have to do with with autonomics and, and health? Well, we'll get to those mechanisms, but you, you know, volitionally can control your heart rate based off of thinking things. That's for better and that's for worse, right? So I could think about um, you know, the biggest stress in my life or you know, coming to this and, and being nervous about speaking, and I can instantly increase my heart rate based off of that. I could also come into this and say, okay, well, I've been here before. I've done this a couple of times. I'm really comfortable. I'm excited. And that could actually lower my heart rate just based off of my intentions and my thought process. So yes, your cerebral cortex is involved with this. Your amygdala is also involved as well too. Your amygdala is this tiny little peanut area of the brain, uh, a heavily heavy driver of your emotional centers. And so um, th this is implicated not only with uh, you know emotions and an emotional regulation of your autonomic nervous system, but the fear response, the fight or flight response that we'll get into. We also have your hypothalamus, brainstem centers, which is where m most of your autonomic nervous system lives, and then your stria terminalis. And this is this is once again an area of the brain that's involved with the amygdala, the midbrain, and the brainstem with emotional responses. So these are like the visceral responses of you know somebody saying something to you, and you're, you get a pit in your stomach or your pupils get big. You have an you have an automated autonomic response based off of that. And overall, we can generally kind of state that your autonomic nervous system has two divisions: the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. So uh, most of you are docs in here, and I assume most of you, uh, in some way, shape, or form, have interacted with these systems. Your sympathetic sympathetic system is your fight or flight response, right? So things that are like increase your heart rates, uh, increase your uh, pupil dilation, increased uh, myocardial contractility. And the exact opposite, opposite of this is your parasympathetic nervous system, right? So this really is the uh, vagus nerve system that's being implicated with this. Your, your vagal output or your vagus nerve is heavily correlated and implicated with the parasympathetic nervous system. And this is the exact opposite of the fight or flight response. So decreases in heart rate, uh, decreased pupil responses, uh, decreased myocardial contractility, um, changes in vascularity and blood flow. So you'll also see changes in, in, in perfusion to the gut. So in a sympathetic fight or flight response, right? So this is the, the bear in the boardroom. This is the fight or flight response that you're gonna have. Um, your immune system actually becomes suppressed with this. And we'll get more into that detail with that. We also see uh, changes in blood flow to the gut into the vascular centers um, with, within the abdomen. And, and the reasoning for that is that if running away, running away from a bear, you really don't need to have an immune system. You don't really need to have an opportunity to digest the food that you just ate. Now, that's a problem for those who are chronically in a stressed state or a constant fight or flight response, which for most of us in the world living today, uh, unfortunately are. And if we don't intentionally take you know, moments to truly work on that, um, then we're gonna see changes that we're witnessing across the world with chronic disease, chronic infections, things along those lines, because of the alterations that occur in our autonomic nervous system. The system is very important. And once again, the generalization I'm gonna make is that most people are sympathetic dominant, okay? Um, and so uh, what we're looking at here is trying to find ways to help people increase their vagal tone or vagus nerve function. Uh, this, this vagus nerve has both afferent and efferent inputs into the brain and body. Um, and it really plays a key role between higher central uh, states uh, within the brain. And so um, 
it's interesting because 80% of the vagus nerve is actually sensory information going into the nervous system, and 20% is actually efferent fibers that are going out to affect the periphery. Um, what's interesting with, with this is that we really still don't fully understand the full innervation or extent of the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve is kind of the wandering nerve, right? So it really controls anything from like the mid part of the neck all the way down to like the distal two thirds of your large intestine. Um, and that's a lot of real estate. Um, there is a lot of activity going on and there's a lot of opportunities for the vagus nerve to have primary, secondary, and even tertiary outcomes with those centers. One thing that's uh, something to note as well is that at your vagus nerve, once again, right? So lungs, diaphragm, liver, intestines, myocardial uh, um, outcomes with it and, and, and affecting the spleen. Well, a lot of these things are under autonomic control and so they're automatically going on, but they're really important for us for digestion, right? So for our immune system regulation, for controlling bowel movements. And so as, as we I just, I just mentioned, 80% of the vagus nerve is sending afferent information into the nucleus tractus solitarius. For those of you who aren't aware of that, uh, that area in the brain, the nucleus tractus solitarius is a primary um, relay center in the, in the brainstem. Uh, what's also interesting with this is that the nucleus tractus solitarius is also a point of integration, uh, not only for your peripheral and autonomic uh, inputs into the brain, but it's also important for emotional regulation as well too. Um, so th there is a lot more to the story going on here than just saying, oh, inputs and outputs. There's a lot of modulation. And for those of you who've been to some of my lectures before, I've talked about this. You have a lot of uh, reciprocal connections that are thrown off to different areas, right? So the right cerebellum is always aware of what the left cerebellum is doing, even though they're on different sides of the brain. And this is really important for us as we start talking about neuroplasticity and making changes in the brain and body is that we know that different areas of the brain talk to different areas of the brain. Um, and so this is a really important aspect, especially for autonomic function, because it's not an all or none thing. So your autonomic functions without voluntary control, but it can be mediated through cognitive processes, and we already talked about that. Your amygdala uh, is, is believed to be a very large source of modulation for your autonomic response. And so what does that mean? Well, your fight or flight responses, these emotional outcomes that we experience every day, um, have a hev are heavily driven and heavily modify your autonomic outcomes, blood pressure regulation, digestion, heart rate, right? And all these things that we kind of take for granted until all of a sudden things start getting a little bit wonky. Maybe it's after a concussion or it's after a traumatic event or maybe it's after an emotional event where now you have changes that are occurring with your ability to respond to environmental cues and maybe you start developing anxiety. Maybe it's a little PTSD. And so um, I think what's really important with this is that it's not an all or none response, right? So um, you always have sympathetic tone going on in parallel or coordination with parasympathetic tone as well too. They're both tonically firing at all times. It's just, when we take a look at what's going on in the system, we have to understand that one may be more dominant than the other. And, and, the, and the, the running trend that I'm gonna say is that we're for the most part going to be sympathetically dominant um, in a lot of disease states. And this is essentially what heart rate variability is actually measuring. And we'll talk a little bit about that because um, you, this essentially affects all organs and tissues throughout the brain and body. So cardiac muscle, smooth muscle, endocrine and exocrine organs, right? So that's really important for us. We'll talk about the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, this HPA axis, this large driver of um, production of different types of hormones, especially cortisol, regulates your blood pressure, you know, gastrointestinal responses, even helps with focusing of the eyes, right? So pupillo uh, constriction and pupillo um, dilation, these are, basic things that, you know, we don't ever have to put a bunch of mental real estate towards, but uh, what's really important for this is that when you see signs and symptoms of dysautonomia, you have to understand that there are going to be global consequences as a result of this. So those patients who come in who maybe have, you know, a previously diagnosed uh, you know, disease state of like POTS, right, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, or maybe they have some sort of dysautonomia where they have elevated heart rate, elevated blood pressure, so this tachycardia, things along those lines, these are real things that are gonna affect all areas of the brain and the body because your autonomics affect and are, in, and are um, innervated and modified and modulated by all these different areas of the brain and body. And so trauma changes the autonomic nervous system. And we know that. I see this all the time with patients with concussions, with brain injuries. The autonomic nervous system affects all the tissues and all the organs throughout the brain and body. So of course it's gonna make sense that these areas are gonna become implicated and maybe compromised following trauma. And we know that during a traumatic event and a stress response, we see a couple of things. We see these massive amounts of catecholamines released. That's norepinephrine, that's epinephrine. These, these moments trigger inflammatory responses and they alter the immune system. 
Now, this can trigger multiple things, and so this is what's really important for us to understand is that, you know, 10 patients with the same vector with a concussion or an auto accident are probably each going to need 10 different treatment plans that are individualized to them because underlying inflammation in one patient may be very different than in another patient, yet the vector is the same, the mechanism could be the same, but the outcomes could be very different. And once again, we see some significant changes in, in this very this very large um, pathway called the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal pathway. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about what's actually going on with that. Heart rate variability is a really good way to assess autonomic function in your office. Now, uh, for those of you who have like wearable and objective technologies, like my wedding ring is an aura ring, popular uh, brands like the Whoop Band or Fitbit or even an Apple Watch can give us more information as to what's actually going on. And heart rate variability is really just a non-invasive marker reflecting the activity of the balance between the sympathetic and parasympathetic components of the autonomic nervous system. And, and what's important with this is that between each heartbeat, there is variability within, uh, within, within that mechanism. Uh, that's really what heart rate variability is measuring. And so we actually wanna have flexibility or resiliency, right? So we'll talk about metabolic resiliency and flexibility. You also wanna have autonomic or neurological flexibility and resiliency. And high heart rate variability is actually a good thing. Because what that means is that your brain and your nervous system can adapt to both stress responses and moments where you actually need to be able to relax and not, not feel like you're fighting or in a constant fight or flight response. Low heart rate variability is actually bad. And, and unfortunately, what we're finding is that lower heart rate variability markers have been seen across many different types of disorders, psychiatric disorders, brain injuries, generalized anxiety, PTSD. I mean, the list kind of goes on. And so having a high variability between your parasympathetic and sympathetic activities is really good because it means that your brain and nervous system can adapt appropriately to your environment. And that's a big marker right there, the appropriate responsibility, re appropriate reactivity, because somebody could be looking outside and have a complete stress response because they perceive something that might, or might not actually be a stress response, right? So well, the problem with this is that we don't always know what those stress responses are gonna manifest as. If you're wondering and looking for an objective way to measure stress responses or how your outcomes um, are being manifested with your patient's, uh, you know, nervous system, use heart rate variability, right? Get a pulse ox, right? Put it on the finger, check the pulse oxygenation and check heart rate. You can use those markers to justify and show whether or not your outcomes are having uh, beneficial, um, beneficial outcomes, essentially. Um, if you give somebody an adjustment and all of a sudden you see their heart rate elevate and you see their pulse oxygenation drop, was that good? Did you, did you, amount, a mean, did you amount a stress response? Possibly. Was that a good thing, right? I mean, it, I would argue that it probably wasn't a good thing if you're seeing those markers go up, go down and go off. Maybe they feel better, but also maybe now they're a little dizzy. Did you did you maybe push them too hard neurologically or structurally? Those are real things that we have to consider and think about. I mean, we've all had changes that have occurred with, with different types of therapies and outcomes that we weren't always hoping and expecting. And this is a really important factor with, with taking a look at what's actually going on during trauma. With trauma, yes, you can have structural outcomes, Yes, you can have neurological outcomes, but you can also have metabolic outcomes. And, and this is a really important factor because we know that damage to the brain can cause alterations in blood-brain barrier integrity. It can affect neutrophil counts, natural killer counts, different types of T regulatory cell counts. It can affect permeability in the gut, in the brain, and yes, even in the lungs, something that's relatively important for us, especially with dealing with COVID. People who have compromised barriers are probably gonna have a harder time getting over um, different types of uh, diseases, right? Or even the common cold, right? So uh, we have to take this into consideration when we're thinking about dysautonomia and dysregulation of different types of metabolic uh, and neurological processes. Damage can also cause different things like UTIs, pneumonias, opportunistic infections. And these are two really important pro-inflammatory mediators that I want you to pay attention to. Interleukin-6 and tumor necrosis factor alpha. This will come up time and time and time again. This is really important for us to take a look into consideration because low-level laser therapy can shunt the production of interleukin-6 and tumor necrosis factor alpha. These are really important molecules for dampening inflammatory responses. And as we start seeing these processes go on in the background, it's a positive feedback loop. So these are, these are the patients with chronic pain where it started as a little hitch in their giddy up and all of a sudden they're like, yeah, now my back went from being a one out of 10, now it's a four out of 10. Now it's an eight out of 10. Now I'm having troubles walking. 
right? That's actually neuroplasticity working in a negative way. We always promote plasticity and neuroplasticity in a positive light, saying, oh, neuroplasticity is what allows you to learn and to think and to do new things. But we also have to understand, too, that neuroplastic changes can occur in the brain and body in a negative way. That's what chronic regional pain syndrome is. It's, it's the elevated sympathetic windup. And what happens is now these neurons that fire and wire together start promoting pain, pro-inflammatory mediators like IL-6, tumor necrosis factor alpha, to the point now where your brain thinks that that's the normal uh, new status quo for you. And that's a problem. Those are very difficult to disrupt. But once again, that's a, that's a dysautonomia. That's a dysautonomia outcome based off the fact that we have central changes in the brain occurring as a result of that. So what do we do about this, right? So we have all these changes that occur with the immune system. We have all of these factors being modulated. We have breaking down of different types of barriers, the lungs, the intestines, the blood-brain barrier. What can we do? Because at the end of the day, what happens is once you have trauma to the brain, not only do you have neurological outcomes, but now we see hormone disruption, right? We have this neuroendocrine axis that becomes altered. And so I think this picture kind of depicts a really unique aspect of, of what this really looks like from a, a visual standpoint. In a natural state, we have balance between your fight or flight responses and your vagal tone. And so inputs should match outputs. We should have a good balance and there should be some coordination between the hypothalamus, uh, the pituitary gland, and all these different centers that are really important for endocrine production. What happens during inflammation or to, during a stress response is you see changes in the alterations of inputs and outputs. And now we have not only systemic inflammation, but the immune system kind of goes awry. We, come in, we go into this type of immune shock where uh, different types of neural mediators and immune mediators are now kind of dysfunct and all over the place. And then over time too, what can actually happen is you can actually have central nervous system uh, in, in injury-induced immune deficiency syndrome, where your immune system has been pumping out so many mediators for so long that your immune system kind of goes down. And now you're immunocompromised. Now anything that you encounter, whether it's the seasonal flu, COVID, or any sort of a disease or infection, can now start taking you out. And now it can start promoting inflammation. Now it can start promoting these different aspects that are going to start accelerating um, neural loss and dysfunction. What's really interesting with this is we're starting to learn more about what's actually going on when we stimulate the vagus nerve. And we'll talk about what stimulating the vagus nerve actually is or what it looks like. But here's one of the quick things I can show you is I'm stimulating my vagus nerve right now via low level laser. And I'll get to the research and I'll get to the studies with this, but it's as simple as literally putting laser over the left side of the neck and finding where the vagus nerve actually is wrapped around the carotid artery and where it's exposed. And this is where they actually do vagal nerve stimulation surgeries. And I have a photo of that later in the, in the, in the slides. Stimulating the vagus nerve can have some really interesting outcomes. One of the first mechanisms that we know about when you stimulate the vagus nerve is that you can have, uh, st have anti-inflammatory outcomes via stimulation of the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, which actually promotes the release of cortisol by the adrenal gland. Well, let's take a step back for a second. Dr. Reese, you were talking about how constant stress is bad for the brain and bad for the body. Well, that's accurate. But controlled stress and appropriate stressors, use stressors, are actually really important for us to change, grow, and adapt and improve our resiliency, our metabolic and our neurological flexibility to be able to handle stimuli. This is important because what do they give you when you have an infection and you have some sort of inflammatory process going on? Let's say it's for a knee. What would they do for, for a knee? They might give a cortisone injection, right? Well, what is a cortisone? Cortisone is a, is a modified version of cortisol. And so what, what can happen is when you stimulate the vagus nerve in an appropriate manner, you can actually have anti-inflammatory responses via the stimulation of the HPA axis through the mechanism of cortisol release. The second way that you can actually have changes with the immune system is through this cholinergic anti-inflammatory pathway. What does this mean? What we're essentially noticing and finding is that when you stimulate the vagus nerve, the vagus nerve actually releases acetylcholine at the synaptic junction with macrophages. This acetylcholine binds to these alpha-7 nicotinic ACH receptors on macrophages, and it inhibits the release of tumor necrosis factor alpha. What did we just talk about for a heavy, heavy pro-inflammatory mediator in the last slide? Tumor necrosis factor alpha. So what we're finding is when you stimulate the vagus nerve, you can actually decrease the production of tumor necrosis factor alpha. The other mechanism is that when you stimulate the vagus nerve, you also have a splenic sympathetic anti-inflammatory pathway, where as weird as it sounds, vagus, the vagus nerve stimulates the, the splenic sympathetic nerve, causing a release of norepinephrine, that catecholamine response, 
which binds to splenic lymphocytes that utilize acetylcholine to once again bind to those alpha-7 nicotinic ACH receptors. Now, these are just the mechanisms that we know about because as we talked about earlier, we don't actually fully know a ton about the vagus nerve and all the mechanisms identified. But this is a really interesting photo of this, right? So uh, here we see, one, the activation of the HPA axis. The second one we see is efferent fibers coming out, releasing acetylcholine, binding to those alpha-7 uh, nicotinic um, acetylcholine receptors on the macrophage. Not only do we see tumor necrosis factor alpha being modified via that macrophage, we also see it going through the splenic nerve as well too, through that celiac ganglion. Now, this is important because what are these things doing? Well, they're modulating not only neurological, but they're modulating metabolic factors as a result of stimulating the vagus nerve. This is not just a neural mechanism anymore. This is a metabolic cascade that we're seeing as a result of the neurological input via stimulation of the vagus nerve. We know that the vagus nerve is very sensitive to peripheral pro-inflammatory mediators. And once again, the same ones pop up, interleukin-6 and tumor necrosis factor alpha. These are released by macrophages and immune cells in times of stress. Not only just stress, but in dysbiosis, so gut dysbiosis, in the production of lipopolysaccharides, where you get into this, this cycle of bad bacteria start producing lipopolysaccharides, which act as endotoxins, they break down your gut-brain barrier, gut barrier first, and subsequently your brain barrier. And what happens over time is that you start having this afferent input into the vagus nerve, right? So into this nucleus tractus solitarius, which has both, both descending and ascending outcomes as a result of, uh, of, of the pathways that it affects. So here's what I'm saying is that lipopolysaccharide production, dysbiosis of the gut can have secondary effects. Remember the 80% afferent inputs into the brain can secondarily affect your brain and body. And as a result of that, it can affect your immune system. What's really interesting with this is that when septic shock was, in, was created by injecting lipopolysaccharides into a model uh, with rodents, it was prevented by vagal nerve stimulation. And this is how powerful this anti-inflammatory pathway can be. So what they did is they injected lipopolysaccharides into, into rats. And what they found was that when they stimulated the vagus nerve in rats through the same mechanism that I just showed you, what they found is that septic shock was actually prevented by stimulating the vagus nerve. Really cool, really interesting. So how do you stimulate the vagus nerve? Well, there are many mechanisms to stimulate the vagus nerve. Anything that will metaphorically decrease uh, sympathetic function will stimulate the vagus nerve. So that things like belly breathing, right? Utilizing these lower brain stem centers of the brain, cranial nerves nine, 10, sometimes even 11, humming and singing, vagal nerve stimulation via low level laser therapy, a very effective non-invasive way to stimulate the vagus nerve. And here I specifically have this over a patient's gut. Well, why would that make sense? Well, of course I wanna affect the enteric nervous system. There's a hundred million neurons in that enteric nervous system that have glial cells that are involved uh, in immune regulation as well. Um, but, but you can also use lower uh, vagal nerve stimulation over the left side of the carotid artery, right over here at the junction of the neck, right where your SCM is located. You pinch that and you go right posterior to it. This is where your vagus nerve is wrapped around that carotid sheath and the carotid artery. Really important mechanism for us because I don't have to go in and do surgery to affect the vagus nerve anymore. I can use low level laser therapy to, use, to utilize different mechanisms, both suprasegmental and infrasegmental reflexes, to now stimulate the vagus nerve. And so what do I do with my patients? Well, I take, I take, my, I take my, my laser, I throw it over the left side of the neck, I'll do, I'll do laser over the belly as well. And this patient right now is actually using transauricular vagal nerve stimulation over the ears. I'm, I'm hitting all these different levels of being able to stimulate the vagus nerve to try and increase vagal tone and decrease sympathetic activity. And what they've found, and the research is relatively clear on this, although there's still some debate as to how far we need to go and what else we need to investigate, what we're finding is that these modalities, especially when they're paired together, are very effective at increasing vagal tone. Yes, I'm having my patients belly breathe at home. Yes, I'm having them humming or doing some sort of transcendental meditation while they're on these therapies. But anything I can do to help these patients update their software and increase vagal tone, I'm going to throw at them. And low-level laser is one of the most effective ways to do that, especially since it's non-invasive. Most of the patients that I'm working with in my office have concussions and brain injuries and trauma, and most of them are light sensitive and can't really handle a lot of auditory stimuli. So when I throw them on a modality, I wanna make sure that I'm not gonna trigger a sympathetic response because that's gonna negate everything that we're actually focusing and working on. What's really interesting as we start digging into more of a traumatic model is that we aren't really sure 
as to what is causing different types of neurocognitive deficits after concussions. Is it the shearing forces of the coup, counter coup movement of the shearing forces of, of, of these neurons that are being taken out? Is it the biochemical cascade? Well, we actually don't really know. But what we know is that the brain's in a vulnerable state following this. There are changes in metabolic capacities with glucose metabolism. We see changes in cerebral blood flow. This is really important for us. So those of you who have, who have been to some of my lectures before, talking about what happens during uh, a, a traumatic brain injury or concussion, what should happen over time is that if I'm going to move my right arm, I should see increased activity via MRI in my right cerebellum and my left prefrontal cortex. Neurons that fire together, wire together, they also require blood and oxygen and increased metabolic capacity to fulfill um, the ability to be able to do that activity. But what happens with a concussion or a brain injury is that those mechanisms actually become decoupled. And this is the exact mechanism that functional MRIs use. If I see movement and a lot of neural activity, I should see more blood flow in those areas. Well, following a concussion, we don't see that. When we see more activity in the left frontal lobe and the right cerebellum, we actually don't see more blood flow. We see less blood flow. And this is where lasers can be really effective is that we know that lasers can increase local blood flow as a result of the mechanisms at play, right? So optimizing ATP production, upregulate, upregulating cytochrome C oxidase. This is really impactful for my patients who just got concussions and brain injuries, and they're told to just go rest and hang out for a while in a dark room. Now, I'm not opposed to that, but uh, the plea to insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result each time. Some of these patients need to actually start moving. And what we know with some of the research coming out now is that the quicker we get these people to be cardiovascularly active, maybe it's just walking, maybe it's just physically moving, the quicker they actually start recovering. Well, why would that make sense? You're modifying and increasing the capacity for your autonomic nervous system. And these patients who are left saying, I need to rest and recover, and now it's days, weeks, or even months, some people don't have that. I mean, take a look at this, right? So how, long, how much would it cost Lionel Messi or cost PH, P, PSG to have Lionel Messi be out for a few months versus a few weeks? Lionel Messi is a pretty pricey price tag to have out for a few months versus a few weeks. Providers who have access to different modalities to upregulate the autonomic nervous system, increasing vagal tone and decreasing sympathetic activity, which once again is a default that we all fall into, especially in the presence of trauma, low-level laser could be a very effective tool at helping you disrupt this metabolic cascade. And what's even more interesting with this is once we start seeing trauma to the brain, we also see changes in, in gut permeability. This study is one of my favorite studies and I use it in nearly every lecture that I do because it's so powerful and so impactful. So what they did is, this was uh, in the Journal of Neurotrauma in 2009, what they did is they induced uh, a traumatic brain injury in rats. They didn't touch the gut at all. And what they did is they did sagittal uh, cross-sectional views of the gut. And what they found was that within six hours of a brain injury, there were significant changes in gut mucosal integrity, aka gut permeability, um, in rats. And so the top photo is what a normal GI mucosa should look like. The bottom photo is essentially what like leaky gut or like an increased intestinal permeability actually looks like. In a normal mucosa, you should have a lot of surface area. There should be some tight junctions. Your gut lining is actually one cell thick. All of the large barriers in the hills that you see and the valleys that you see is actually your, your, your mucosal lining. Well, as I was doing research for this lecture, what I actually found out is that when you increase vagal um, activity via vagus nerve stimulation, your vagus nerve can actually increase gut mucosal production. Of course it can, right? And so now we have a conversation where it's not only just having an, uh, an outcome on your immune system and balancing out your sympathetic and parasympathetic activity, we also see it having metabolic changes, changes in gut flow, right? So maybe this is the patient on that you've done a ton of work with metabolically. You put them on probiotics or take an anti-inflammatory fish oil, you're giving them vitamin D, they're taking L-glutamine, they're doing all these things to promote their gut function, but they haven't seen a change in any of their gut function. Their permeability hasn't really modified that much. Maybe you're now you're doing food sensitivity panels, and now these patients you know, haven't changed much as far as, far as their, their expression is concerned. Could there be an autonomic or neurological outcome that could mediate this mechanism to help you advance or promote the opportunity to, to improve the gut barrier lining? Absolutely. Well, level laser therapy time and time again has been shown not only to increase vagal tone, but vagus nerve stimulation in whatever mechanism it is uh, can actually improve mucosal lining integrity. And this is important because not only within six hours of a TBI do you see these changes, but we see increased permeability almost three or fourfold as a result of that. And so that's an important marker because we know that now that there's increased permeability in the gut, 
what we're finding is that there can be different things like lipopolysaccharides, food particles that get into the bloodstream. Maybe now your immune system's already defunct because of trauma, and now your immune cells are starting to tag normal foods that you're eating as foreign invaders. Maybe now you get a sensitivity to apples or blueberries, things that should metaphorically be healthy for you, but your immune system is now mounting immune response to. Well, well, that's not good. We also see changes in gut and in, in the intestinal barrier proteins. So zonulin and occludin are both decreased by 49 and 73 percent within six hours of a traumatic brain injury. Here's the kicker with this: these intestinal barrier proteins are the same barrier proteins that are found in the gut and the brain. So if you have a leaky barrier going on in the gut, what's going to happen to the brain? The brain's going to become affected. But once again, here's what we find. Gut, brain, gut barrier failure is a major contributor to organ failure after hemor hemorrhagic shock and trauma. Of course it is. We talked about that. The gut can be a huge source for cytokine production. And what cytokines do you think they're going to be? Interleukin-6 and tumor necrosis factor alpha. What they've found is that gut barrier disruption allows different types of bacteria, specifically lipopolysaccharides, to invade and infiltrate that, that really tightly regulated uh, gut, gut barrier. What's interesting is that in burn models, vagal nerve stimulation can improve gut barrier integrity as being measured by occludin protein expression. Okay, we just touched on that. It's been implicated in playing an essential role in regulating the inflammatory responses and even inhibiting the severity of experimental pancreatitis. This is a neural mechanism that has a metabolic outcome. And if you can increase vagal tone or vagus activity, then what you can do is you can see changes not only uh, neurologically, but metabolically and even emotionally too. We know that the vagus nerve is implicated with that. Once again, this is a, just a great photo of vagus nerve stimulation. Low level laser, this is an FX635, which I have in my clinic, which I love using because it's hands off, hands free, and I don't have to touch it after I set it onto a patient. I can leave patients be, I can let them do their meditation, their breathing mechanisms, focusing on diaphragmatic belly breathing. I can hook them up to transauricular cranial or transauricular vagal nerve stimulation to the ears. And I can have this massive barrage of vagal nerve stimulation going on, and patients notice the difference. I'll reference a study later talking about vagus nerve stimulation on, on normal, healthy 55-year-old individuals. What they found is that the people who had the largest discrepancy or who were mostly sympathetic dominant saw the greatest improvements and the greatest benefits from utilizing vagal nerve stimulation. And, and this is really important for us because once the gut becomes compromised, we know that the brain becomes compromised. And, and even if the brain's compromised, there's a lot more to the story going on there because what happens when the brain becomes compromised? We start losing neurons, we start losing cells. This is the neurodegenerative model that we're looking at for autism, or not autism, but Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, uh, different types of movement disorders. Uh, this is really prevalent for us right now. And a lot of people are dealing with this, um, you know, 10, 15 years prior to actually showing any neurological outcomes. It can start with gut dysbiosis, gut problems, uh, Crohn's disease, different types of autoimmune conditions that are affecting the gut. And so this kind of just sets us up for autoimmune conditions, food sensitivities, allergies, uh, chronic inflammatory pr processes. And this is really how it starts, right? So uh, you should have in tight, tact, um, uh, tight junctions in the blood-brain barrier. Once again, occluded and zonulin are those uh, proteins for gap junction proteins in the gut and the brain. And so as we start having an autoreactive antibody process going through, you see antibodies build up in that blood-brain barrier. What happens is you start to penetrate the astrocytes uh, in the blood-brain barrier. And so what you see is you see an inflammatory response. It not only takes out astrocytes, which are really important for the integrity of the blood-brain barrier, what you also see is you start seeing a rapid loss of neurons. And as you start moving forward and forward, you have glial priming. You have the production of glutamate, pro-inflammatory pro cytokines, tumor necrosis factor alpha, interleukin-6. You start seeing mitochondrial dysfunction. I mean, this is where the power of low-level laser comes in because it literally attacks every single one of those mechanisms. We know that low-level laser can affect glial uh, reactivity. It can dampen glial uh, reactivity and get the glia to go back to a safe state. We know that it affects pro-inflammatory cytokines, inter interleukin-6, tumor necrosis factor alpha. We know that low-level laser can upregulate ATP production via mitochondrial expression, upregulating cytochrome C oxidase, that rate-limiting enzyme process uh, occurring with ATP production with the electron transport chain. We know that these mechanisms exist. It's just a, it's just an implication of you utilizing this within your office. And so as you stimulate the vagus nerve, we talked about this cholinergic anti-inflammatory pathway. Look at the amount of inflammatory markers that are affected via uh, peripheral um, uh, vagal nerve stimulation. 
Interleukin 1B, IL-6, tumor necrosis factor alpha, we talked about those already. Interleukin 10, HMGB1, interleukin 11, and interleukin 13, all very well established and very well known inflammatory markers. Now, what's really interesting with this is that tumor necrosis or vagal nerve stimulation can specifically affect interleukin 6 and tumor necrosis factor alpha through this um, uh, acetyl, acetylcholine uh, anti-inflammatory pathway. And this is one of the reasons why they're looking into vagal nerve stimulation to treat rheumatoid arthritis, is because rheumatoid arthritis is heavily driven by tumor necrosis factor alpha. The, the gold standard for treating rheumatoid arthritis is taking anti-TNF alpha um, medications to specifically modulate this inflammatory pathway. Well, what if it's just as easy as utilizing low-level laser therapy? We know low-level laser therapy affects specific pathways and rate-limiting pathways in, in the promotion of inflammation and that's NF-kappa-beta. We know in that closed-head TBI mouse models that low-level laser therapy can prevent the occurrence of secondary brain injury by, by suppressing interleukin-6, interleukin-1b. This is really important for us because as you start firing these different pathways, they become positive feedback loops. And this is, this is a big factor for like microglial activity. Glia are actually your friend. Until they get turned on, they're rampant, they start promoting inflammation, they start taking out healthy tissue. It becomes a problem because not only are the glial prime, but your immune system becomes prime. Different types of production of IgG, IgM, and IgA antibodies can start wreaking havoc on different types of tissues. So not only do you see this across the board throughout the entire immune system, but you also see it in this rapid setting of changing the gut, changing the brain, and then also having secondary consequences with glia. And I've kind of essentially gone through this already, but I think this is a really important factor about the immunoexcitotoxicity model of what happens with uh, different types of traumatic events. So I think it's really important for us to take a look at what actually happens with inflammation and trauma from a microglial and from a mitochondrial standpoint. We see different metabolic changes occurring. And a lot of times what happens is you see this dysregulation of utilizing glucose. Your brain and your body spend one third of your global energy expenditures regulating your sodium potassium pump to, and, and utilizing glucose to regulate this internal um, uh, metabolic capacity of where neurons and different types of cells sit. This is, this is where your neurons, uh, with, with regard to your depolarization of your neurons, are really important. And you can become hyperpolarized or hypopolarized, being closer to threshold or further away from threshold based off of what trauma can actually uh, manifest and what types of inflammation you're actually dealing with prior to an injury. We know low-level laser can increase mitochondrial function based off of these mechanisms. This positive feedback loop is one of the most difficult things for you to, to inter interrupt as a result of you utilizing low-level laser therapy. For those of you who do functional medicine as a result of uh, different types of trauma, magnesium is super, super important for the maintenance and regulation of these different types of neural mechanisms. Magnesium is responsible for like 200 different enzymatic processes within the brain and the body. And these NMDA receptors are really important for long-term memory storage, uh, utilizing different types of oxidative and, and glycolytic uh, mechanisms as well. And, and what happens is we know that magnesium levels will decrease immediately after a brain injury and a concussion. The best type of magnesium to utilize, and you can confirm this with the man, the myth legend, Dr. Rob Silverman, uh, is for a brain injury or concussion, you want to utilize magnesium. Um, God, I'm blanking on it right now, actually. You want to utilize magnesium threonate. Magnesium threonate is the only magnesium metabolite that can actually cross the blood brain barrier. Different types of magnesium, like magnesium glycinate, magnesium um, uh, stearate, things along those lines, not magnesium stearate, magnesium glycinate. Um, it can, can be very effective for different types of gut-based mechanisms or different types of soft tissue or muscle cramping mechanisms. Magnesium 3 and is the ultimate magnesium for utilizing um, over the for utilizing within the brain because we know it crosses the blood-brain barrier. And as we start digging into more of this microvascular and injury-based uh, traumatic events, it's the same mechanism over and over and over again. It leads to neurodegenerative conditions. We start losing neurons. We start seeing changes in the immune system. We start seeing this excitotoxicity model within calcium, and this is really where the where the rubber meets the road as far as the end game. When intracellular calcium is brought into the cell, uh, we start seeing metabolic changes and pretty much controlled and uncontrolled cell death. Now, this is this is what gets really interesting with this uh, regards to vagal nerve stimulation because what they've done is they've actually done vagal nerve stimulation with healthy age 55 year olds. What they found is they saw two weeks of daily transcranial or transauricular uh, vagal nerve stimulation, 
they found increased uh, quality of life measures, they found in improvements in mood, and they found improvements in sleep. They saw improvements in heart rate variability, specifically through reductions in sympathetic activity. Well, of course they did. This is the yin and the yang conversation we had in the beginning, right? If your sympathetics are high, your vagal tone or your parasympathetics are gonna be relatively low. And so as we start seeing these mechanisms improve and change over time, we start seeing additional benefits. Now, this is what invasive vagal nerve stimulation actually looks like. The picture on the left is, is the vagus nerve on the left side of the carotid artery. The carotid sheath is opened and moved. And the vagus nerve is, is the part that's exposed over that, that rubber sheet. The right side is actually the implantation of a true vagal nerve stimulator. This is the analogous to essentially being like a, a, a different type of like electrical mechanism for you to regulate, um, you know, your heart rate. So we'll take a look at like, uh, you know, what you would use for like a pacemaker. Um, it's a, kind of the same mechanism. The, the, the regulator is implanted into your thoracic wall and, you know, battery has to replace every six years. What they're doing is they're stimulating the vagus nerve electrical shock. Now, none of you on this call, for the most part, are going to be doing vagal nerve stimulation anytime soon. So what do you think are viable alternatives for you to utilize to stimulate the vagus nerve? Low-level laser, right? Humming, singing, breathing, maybe transauricular vagal nerve stimulation. Why not all of the mechanisms above? A healthy diet, exercise can be great ways to balance out this vagal and sympathetic tone. Now, none of you are gonna go ahead and do that, but what I wanna tell you is that you can stimulate the vagus nerve via low-level laser therapy. And this is a great, great um, uh, study done by Clixa Machado uh, talking about utilizing low-level laser therapy and stimulating the vagus nerve. Now, this is a QEEG uh, 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 study that he did without touching the head or the brain at all. What they did is they stimulated the vagus nerve over the left side of the, of the carotid artery. And so I'll talk about why they did the left versus the right in a minute. And I know there's a question on that as well. Just take a look at the, the before and after photos of what a QEEG looked like from a basal record with basal stimulation and post-vagal stimulation. A night and day difference. Now they're looking at different alpha and, and um, beta bands as a result of this. And so there's a little caveat in there, but what I wanna show you is that they literally just did low level laser therapy over the left side of the neck, just like what I'm doing right now. And after 10 minutes, this is what the differences looked like in QEEG results with these patients. Now they did a difference with between violet light versus red and violet. And so I'll get into a little bit more of a distinction here, but once again, what you see is some pretty notable changes in the brain and the as a result of doing vagal nerve stimulation on the left side of the neck. Now, once again, what they did is they applied this for 10 minutes um, and it was over the left side of the neck for a reason. Um, if you take a look at the difference between the left vagus nerve and the right vagus nerve, the right vagus nerve uh, specifically innervates the SA node. And this is with this is with dealing with the heart rate in the heart rhythm, um, or the heart rate specifically um, in the heart. And the left side deals with more the contraction properties of the heart. And so the reason they go after the left side versus the right is that what what happens is what they've found is that when you stimulate the right side, you probably theoretically from a neurophysiological perspective, you would have a higher chance of having maybe a tachycardic or an arrhythmia event going on the right side of the neck. The reason they do the left side is they've gotten better results. Now they do still do um, vagal nerve stimulation on the right side with vagal nerve stimulation surgeries if they can't get the left side, and they just modify it and regulate it based off of you using HRV, EEG, things along those lines, EKGs for the heart as well. But what they found is that violent low-level laser therapy might be the best treatment for epilepsy due to the, re due to the reduction of paroxysmal brain activity, and that was the, the first photo that I had showed you. But what they found is for the most part, and I assume most of you aren't treating epilepsy um, in your offices, they found that red and violet low level laser will be the most useful for conditions like depression, neurorehabilitation, dementia, autism, and coma due to, the, due to the increased ability and coupled blood flow that enhanced the EEG signaling with this study. Now, this was a study of, I think, 10 or 20 patients. And so we can't you know, take it to the bank yet fully, but what's beautiful about this is Raconia is doing these studies. And having 20 of the 23 FDA approved um, patents for low level laser, and the average study costing, you know, a little bit north of, you know, seven figures, they're putting the reputation on the line to make sure that you're getting the best product and you're getting products and, and utilizing products for therapies that are actually working in research based. And this is one of the big reasons why a lot of us providers are coming into the space is that we want to know that our products are being trusted and that we can utilize them to have the highest efficacy possible. And so this is why this, this is why we do this is that dysautonomia and POTS are not easy things to treat. Um, when you treat dysautonomia, you're essentially treating the brain and the body as a result of that, because we talked about the autonomics 
um, affecting virtually every single system in your brain and body. Now, I'm gonna get into a little bit more specific with this, and I'm, I'm almost towards the end of my slides, but if you're gonna test the autonomics or you're gonna assess and evaluate and then an, an, um, an interpret or implement different types of um, therapies, you have to know what you're looking at. If you don't test it, you don't know that you don't know if it's beneficial or if it's not helping them. And so what I would say is that you really need to understand these mechanisms, not only you know, from a, a, a theoretical standpoint, but what are you gonna do in your office? Well, get a pulse ox, get a heart rate variability monitor, look at blood pressure, look at pulse oxygenation, do different types of tilt table testing. Um, you need to look at auscultation and breathing. You need to check the, the vasculature of the neck, of the, of the abdo abdomen, of the head. You need to understand how autonomic dysfunction can manifest in many ways. You need to understand why pupils would be look, would be manifesting in different ways as a result of different different mechanisms like looking at pupil dysfunction, things along those lines with light and indirect light uh, mechanisms. Heart rate variability, EKG, I mean, you're not gonna do all of these in your office, but you need to be aware of them because your patients need to understand those mechanisms and you need to understand those mechanisms to, to importantly help your patients out with this. It doesn't need to be rocket science though, because what could you use to increase vagal tone without knowing any of this stuff? You could utilize low level laser therapy. You could utilize belly breathing. You could utilize different types of humming and, and, and um, different types of singing mechanisms, transcendental meditation, right? All of these things will manifest and increase vagal tone in some way, shape or form. It's just for me clinically, I wanna know that, I, that what I'm doing with my patients is exactly gonna give them the results that we're looking for. And so utilizing, once again, low level laser therapy is one of the most effective non-invasive ways for you to stimulate vagal tone and increasing vagal output. And so I leave you with this last piece. Uh, you know, you can stimulate the vagus nerve in many ways. Um, the challenge for you is to figure out which ones are gonna be most effective and most efficient for you in your office. And so with that being said, I'd like to thank everybody. Um, you know, this is my information for those who are in the States. Um, I'm currently living in London right now and I'll be here for the next two years. So um, for those of you who have questions in the UK, you know, feel free to reach out to Simon and his team. Otherwise you can honestly just email me, um, you know, find my website or just shoot me an email at the email below. Happy to have conversations and discuss anything with anybody um, uh, down the, on, on that mechanism. So without further ado, um, I would like to turn it over to Simon. Simon, I think there's probably a couple of questions in there that I'm looking at. So if you could just help me out with those, um, I would yes, really appreciate did, it. Um, thank you very much for that, uh, Eric. It was very insightful. Um, also noted as well that you knew who Lionel Messi was. So uh, you were... <laughs> um, you're used to the different type of shape of ball across there, even though I do know that you do like your soccer. I do, um, interesting. Yes, football, they call it. Questions coming in. I've answered a couple of them. Um, yep. I don't know whether you could see that. Um, from Nikita, what would I expect to see on an HRV when I have stimulated the vagus nerve? Uh, can you repeat that question again? Yeah, what would I expect to see on an HIV, HRV, sorry, when I have stimulated the vagus nerve? So, so we, what you would see, you would wanna see an increase in HRV levels. Now you have to remember HRV levels are taken over a, a period of time, right? So you wouldn't just see an, uh, an increase in HRV, it would be over a specific period of time. Um, what you wanna see with HRV is you wanna see an increase in it because what that means is that you're having more flexibility of your brain and body going from sympathetic to parasympathetic. So. Um, that's an important mechanism and you would want to see an increase in HRV if you're stimulating the, the, the vagus nerve with whatever mechanism you're going after. Great, thanks for that. Next one from Sasha, who actually did have an accelerate and she's just upgraded up, uh, to the EVRL uh, in the last couple of weeks. Uh, is the right vagal nerve less important than the left? No, they're both important. The reason why we do vagal nerve stimulation on the left side, and whether you're doing surgery on it or you're using you know, your EVRL or whatever modality you wanna go after, is because once again, that right vagus nerve innervates the SA node, and that's the rate and that's the rhythm. And so what you don't wanna do is you don't really wanna mess with that too much. Um, so they're both important because they both have, you know, from a neurological standpoint, everything's bilateral. They have reciprocal uh, you know, uh, communication between each other. It's just we stimulate the left one because we know it's relatively safer to be able to stimulate that side. Um, and that's what a lot of the research has shown too. Great, thanks for that. Um, the next question actually, before handing it over to you, uh, Eric, I'll uh, give a little bit of an answer to from Lindsay. Uh, what settings are you using on the left side of the neck and how long, please? Um, for anybody in the, the Europe, Middle East and African network, uh, we changed the processes uh, to try to simplify things 
Um, because what we're trying to do mainly, no matter what we're actually treating, um, it, it's pretty much, you know, um, using the same process. It's sort of treating um, the nerve root, treating the area of pain. So we developed an, an approach which has settings for uh, acute, where we have one, uh, one two and three. Uh, we have three settings for subacute, which you would use probably from around day four of di day five onwards, if you're treating an injury, for example. Uh, we have settings for wellness and performance, uh, three settings again. Uh, and then we have individual settings, which we have for a brain, for nerve root, uh, for gut and for vagus nerve. So I'm not quite sure which side of the pond you're on, Lindsay, but we tend to stick to that over here. Um, however, Eric obviously has a lot of experience or, or all of his experience on the US side. So I will let you put your slant on that, Eric, from your previous experience. Yeah, I think the biggest message that I would give as takeaway is that the frequencies are not as important as the wavelength. The fact that you have the wavelength of, you know, whether you have an EVRL, you know, 635, 405 with red and violet, um, the wavelength's the biggest, the biggest factor with that because you're you're looking at increasing activity <laughs> with the phytochrome C oxidase, upregulating ATP production in the mitochondria, and then your your cells can utilize that to do the mechanisms that, that are needed. So, um, you know, we can talk all day about frequencies and hertz and all that stuff like that, but the biggest thing is the wavelength that you have. Simon has been amazing in working with Rob to be able to get some uh, really nice protocols for everybody, but don't overthink those. Um, just just point and shoot as we talk about, because that's really the biggest factor going into that. Um, so uh, the, the the frequencies and the hertz are not as big of a factor as utilizing the wavelength, and, and that's inherently built into Oliver Coney's products. So you're in good company on that front. Definitely. I, I think, you know, a lot of you probably have seen the US-based uh, webinars before. So um, you've got to remember their first US FDA market clearance for neck and shoulder pain was in 2002. Um, so they have, you know, over 16,000 uh, pain laser customers in the US, a high percentage of which are in the chiropractic fraternity. So a, a lot of the guys out there have been using the lasers for a long time. So I think, you know, we'll, we'll probably end up moving on to a stage where, you know, we go on to do some webinars on, on, on more advanced settings. But as Eric said, the wavelength is, is what's primarily most important. The frequencies, I suppose you could refer to as, um, the, you know, the cherry on top of the cake. But at the end of the day, whatever you're treating, whichever um, setting you specifically choose, you will still get a response. Um, but, you know, we don't want to overcomplicate things by going too much into the frequencies, um, as we stated, which also I think, you know, what we specifically put in for the acute, subacute and wellness performance settings is also remembering as well that we're providing a sort of prehab type effect as well, which I think you alluded to as well, Eric, earlier on in your um, presentation, um, trying to empower the body, set the body up to be able to cope um, better with whatever, you know, life throws at us, whether that's injuries, infections, diseases, you know, or, or whatever. You know, the laser is a transportation vehicle to get, you know, billions of photons into your body to empower the human body to uh, react more positively. Um, so we've been able to use the lasers on a wide range of different conditions. I don't really think there's anything we can't make a difference on. Um, and I know I'm digressing a little bit here, but one of the big things we're doing in the European market, there's a lot of gray areas when it comes to low level laser. And I think a lot of um, practitioners think that it's just one delivery mechanism, whereas it's really an umbrella for different mechanisms of action. Um, we've got LED, we've got non-thermal laser diode, which we um, which we use. And LED we use as a placebo because it's a non-coherent light. So it really gives us an, uh, an ability to be able to measure the differences between coherent and non-coherent light. Uh, and we have infrared, um, which infrared, again, we're talking about 700 nanometers upwards, which delivers less photonic energy, but more of a heating type effect. So when we're talking about a lot of the neuro conditions that Dr. Reese has talked about, you know, you wouldn't dare treat anything like that with anything that provides heat because you don't know what sort of uh, response you're going to get. And the likelihood is it could be a negative response. So, you know, we're talking about um, non-thermal laser, there's, there's zero heat. It's just um, eradicating all essence of heat and just focusing on optimizing photonic energy delivery. So, you know, I, I think that, 
probably works hand in hand as well with what we're talking about with the settings. It's important to pull non-thermal laser to an extent away from thermal laser or infrared type devices as uh, they really are day and night when it comes to the mechanism of action. I'm sure you probably you agree, Eric, with that as well. Yeah. Yeah, I, I do. Um, you know, I think I think one of the big factors with that is the fact that if it was just photobiomodulation, then there would be there'd be no way for us to just utilize LEDs as a placebo, right? So but I think photobiomodulation is a very large, broad category. Once we start getting really specific and and um, you know you know pushing through those factors of why we use uh, laser, why it is laser and not just photobiomodulation or just light. You know there are mechanisms uh, in in both of those um, ca categories, but the reason why we we like laser and why laser has been so effective is for the reasons that you mentioned. So um, I would I would agree with all of that. Brilliant. That was sort of I was leading. There was another question I actually got from my uh, one of our um, colleagues on on WhatsApp as well. So I just answered that uh, that all in one. Um, next one from Kirsten, who um, has a, I think an FX six three five over in Switzerland. Uh, what type of, oh, she has an EVRL as well, I think. Uh, what type of um, uh, meditation would Dr. Reese suggest during the VNS protocol with the FX635? Yeah, I mean, uh, to, to be honest with you, I don't know if I can answer that fully. I think the only thing I would say with that is you want to have the patient doing something that's going to relax them. So whether it is meditation, you know, for an experienced meditator, that might be something that's relaxing. If it's somebody who's new, maybe they get stressed out because of it. Um, what I would say overall is you want the patient to do something that is going to be relaxing. Maybe that's listening to soft music. Maybe that's listening to their favorite audiobook. Maybe that is just having them lay down or actually just like going to sleep. I mean, there there could be so many mechanisms at play and it's going to be individualized. Um, I do think like different types of like transcendental meditation can be very therapeutic. It just once again depends on the, the patient, uh, their preference, if they're experienced with it. Sometimes starting something new can be stressful, um, even with belly breathing exercises that are designed to increase oxygenation and be vagal tone specifically, but you know they can push people. So I don't have my patients do Wim Hof breathing exercises when they're in the office on vagal nerve stem. I have them you know, do relaxing you know, box breathing or things like that. So you kind of have to use your best judgment and work with your patient on that. But um, as long as it's something that will decrease heart rate or blood pressure and increase oxygenation, you're gonna be in a good spot. Great, thank you for that. Um, Trevor's just asked a couple of questions. If I could generically say, he said, absolutely fascinating talk, Eric. And I, I think with these webinars, we're also conscious of everybody's time. Um, so we do try to cram as much information as what we can into a short space of time. Um, and somebody's asked whether they could get sort of like a PDF copy of the presentation, um, which I'm sure absolutely. you'd be okay with. Yep, always. And, yep. and of course, guys, um, Trevor, we've got a recording of this. So um, one of the girls in the office will send a recording out afterwards and then you can watch it in your own time and try to sort of um, slow things down and, and obviously let us know if you have any questions um, from that. But uh, very pleased that you find it, uh, it useful. Uh, Nikita, again, if I was to use Violet on the EVR. Oh, I answered that. It was just if I was to use Violet on the EVRL, would I just use the ACNE protocol? And I've just said, Eric, in, in, in our experiences, um, we get it de depends on individual preference. We have a, a red violet vagus nerve setting of 10, 10, 10, 10, mm -hmm. um, or some just use the violet by itself. Yeah. Um, it just does seem to be individual preference. Yeah. Well, I think with that Clixa Machado uh, study too, you know, I, I thought that was interesting as well. I mean, very few people are treating epilepsy. So you're better off for the most part almost using the red and the violet. You know that the red has different properties than the violet. Um, but both of them, you know, together appear to to be very effective with being able to balance that out. So, um, yeah, you, you could you could get nitpicky on that. I think I think the best thing for that that I always say clinically is you know get a pulse ox, get a heart rate variability, variability monitor, see what's actually going on from an autonomic response, and then let us know because I always want to know. Um, but that's how I watch patients all the time. I'll do a therapy, look at their pulse ox, and see if it manifested in the way that I thought it should. That's the best way to objectively quantify what's actually going on with your patients. So. Cool. I'm not quite sure if this is um, a question. Uh, Eva um, is an acupuncturist. Um, she specializes in fertility mm -hmm. and she has uh, an EVRL, which has uh, really helped her, her patients massively since she introduced it into the program. Lovely. She's saying in, in a Japanese IVF clinic, they use low level laser therapy on the neck. And again, we have to also understand what type of low level laser therapy it was. Um, I thought that was targeting the vagus nerve, forward stroke, carotid artery. 
and they noticed that women who were qualified as severely infertile prode. I'm not quite sure what that, that's a misprint. Prode, can you see it, Eric, your side or not? Um, I don't think I can, let me see here. It's either a word that I don't know what it means or it's a, it's a, it's a mistype. Um, yeah, I thought that was targeting the vagus nerve carotid artery and they noticed that women were who were qualified as severely infertile prode. Yeah, I'm not sure what that would be. I, I, maybe we'll make the assumption that they improved. Maybe that's what it was. It might have been, yeah. Yeah, it, um, um, yeah I mean, yeah. It, that's without a shadow of a doubt, isn't it? Because, you know, I alluded to the fact before that with all of these sort of photons that we're delivering into the body, it empowers the human body to be more effective. So no matter what you're treating to an extent, you would think that would be pretty uniform, Derek. Well, and, and all the mechanisms that we talked about, right? So not only do you have, you know, with trauma or with chronic disease, infection or stress, you have an imbalance of your parasympathetic and sympathetic systems. When you stimulate the, the you know, the vagus nerve, um, not only do you have the projections that go out, you have that, um, you know, uh, acetylcholine response with affecting macrophages and inhibiting inflammatory responses. You have the, the the splenic outcomes as well too, which you know once again is a sympathetic outcome, and then you have this modulation of macrophages and immune cells in the spleen because of that, and then you also too have the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal outcomes, which is all endocrine and hormone. Well, what is pregnancy, right? So estrogen, progesterone, like luteinizing hormone, these fluctuations, this little dance that we always do from an endocrine perspective. Um, these are things that 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 you know fertility is really important for, um, and just life in general. So um, that doesn't surprise me. Um, I, I guess I think it's just an interesting outcome. I would be curious to learn more about uh, the other outcomes that she's witnessed as well with that. Yeah, without a shadow of a doubt. Eva shares a, quite a bit of information with us. We, we have a clinic in Casablanca as well who have been looking at male fertility. So, um, you know, as a company, obviously Aconia, we can only really discuss um, what we have um, studies and, and what we have seen from studies. Um, but there are so many um, off-label uh, conditions that you can treat. And it is very much trial and error. You know, I think one thing's for sure, you can't do any damage. Mm -hmm. And when you can't do any damage, that gives you a little bit of impetus to to maybe um, experiment and, and, and use it in certain areas based on your own understanding of the physiology and anatomy of the, of the human body. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think that there, I mean, this is what's fun about this is there's still a lot of stuff for us to figure out and, and learn. So um, it's only the beginning. And I'll be, I'm optimistic that we're going to continue to see more and more things that are showing the benefits of, you know, vagal nerve simulation, low level laser therapy and the things we talked about today. Definitely. And apologies if people are getting a good view of the inside of my nostrils, but I've got very focals <laughs> on. I'm sort of looking through the bottom of them to read the, uh, the questions. Yeah, Eva said, sorry, produced higher number and quality blastocytes. Got you. So, um, okay, Rebecca, thank you. Very interesting. Nikita, thank you. Lorna, can you overstimulate the vagus nerve? I mean, I'm sure theoretically you could. I mean, you can do much of anything can be a bad thing, right? So that uh, whole concept of hormesis, right? So try and drink your way out of a pool and you're gonna find very quickly that, you know, water's in excessive amounts is not good either. Um, what I would say though, is it's probably gonna be very rare uh, because for the most part, like I said, we default to being sympathetically dominant. So take a look at a baby, right? A primitive nervous system. Their heart rate is set at like anywhere from like 70 to 190 beats a minute. Um, as you get older, your frontal cortex and your brain start developing and start modulating and inhibiting these lower areas of the brain. But as we age too, right, we start seeing that we become a little bit more sympathetically dominant. Our, our parasympathetic uh, responses don't work as well, right? So our gut function doesn't function as well as it used to be. Uh, brain perfusion isn't as good as it used to be. Um, you know, sexual arousal, things like that, are things aren't as good as they used to be. And so this sympathetic dominance is very prevalent when we're young. It goes away because our brain comes online and regulates things. And then over time, as we start aging and things just start changing and we don't have as much neural integrity, things become more sympathetic dominant. So you're kind of always fighting that. Um, and so with the world that we live in today, socially, economically, and even the foods that we eat and the environment we live in, 99.9% .9 of the time, people are going to be sympathetically dominant no matter what. I have yet to read a case or see a case clinically where somebody has been parasympathetically dominant and that's been a problem for them. I'm sure they're out yeah. there, so maybe I'm not educated, but for the most part, I would not worry at all about stimulating the vagus nerve too much. 
Yeah, definitely. You know, uh, all I can really comment on is, uh, as most know, we have a range of, of lasers that uh, treat fat and reduce the size of fat cells. And the way we do it again is by stimulating the mitochondria very much in the way that we do it with the um, the pain lasers. Um, but what we did notice when we were doing our um, ex vivo and in vitro studies um, for the fat loss lasers was when we were shining a laser on the GDAPA fat cells, yeah. um, we noticed that the cells, the, 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 the photoreceptors seem to stop responding after around 16 to 18 minutes. So a lot of uh, clients will say, can we treat the same area twice? Would we get a better response? But if the photoreceptors are stopped, uh, you know, stopped um, functioning and or, or taking on more photonic energy in that time, all that really happens after that in our experience was nothing. Yeah, it, it didn't have a, a, you know, a negative effect. It just meant that it was just a waste of time treating any more than that. So I think on the pain lasers, especially, we tend to um, uh, we tend to give the, the time scales that we think are most effective. Um, if somebody wants to double up, um, I don't think it would do any harm. Um, it's just a case of, you know, would you, is it just a waste of your time? I mm -hmm. suppose, would you get any more of a response or mm -hmm. would you be better to wait, you know, until the patient's next in the clinic and carry on the treatment? Yeah. And yeah. I would echo that too. And I think the biggest thing that I've brought in with patients and, and, and clinicians who are getting lasers and doing training is like, you just make sure that this is a positive for you, not a negative, right? You should use these lasers to, you know, multiply yourself, to be able to help more patients, you know, maybe make more money too, but it shouldn't take away and clog things down or make things more difficult for you. And that's why I love the handheld, but I, I love, I love the stands. I love the FX635 because I can literally set it, forget it. Patients can be on there for 10. I can go see other patients with it. Um, and, and I know that I'm, they're getting the best, uh, you know, therapy out there. So I think that that's an important factor to think about as well too. Yeah, a new modality sounds great. It might help somebody, but think about the business component. Think about the patient flow. I mean, those are real things that can add a lot of value for that as well too. Um, and a lot of the patients, or a lot of the you know the docs that I've talked to and the patients that I've seen um, have really benefited from that. So because if I have more time with somebody, then they're going to get more from me. Hopefully, they're going to get healthier, and then they can check out of my office, and you know the, the next person's up. Yeah, definitely. Um... Actually, I may have forgot to say this earlier, and Nikita's asking, is the wellness performance good to use for chronic conditions? We also have a setting um, for chronic conditions as well as the uh, acute, subacute, and wellness performance. Um, but you know, as we all keep alluding to, um, the wavelength is, is, is the main aspect of the treatment. Um, we're talking about you know, marginal improvements by um, you know, making um, different uh, frequency settings. Um, presumably, Eric, when you used it in your clinic, did you have a, a chronic setting or did you use um, anything any different to that? Yeah, no, I never really worried about that. I have, you know, some presets and things that I've used, but um, it, I don't really think twice about it. Um, so, you know, I'll pretty much use the Vagal setting for the most part for most of my protocols and that's it. But, you know, I don't really, like I said, the, the frequencies aren't really that important to me. The wavelength is the biggest yeah. factor for that. It is, yeah. and a lot of the frequencies are repeated as well. If I look at um, saying about the the red violet vagus nerve setting before, we used the the settings 10, 10, 10, 10. When I look at wellness and performance, the first wellness and performance setting that's 10, 10, 10, 10. Yep. You know, so you know a lot of it does um, get duplicated. Uh, so you know, use the wellness performance L like anything. We you know we supply the the chronic settings. See what sort of response you get from your patient. And if you would like to see if you can get more of a response, then by all means, try the wellness and performance setting one when they next come in. And then when the third visit, try wellness and uh, performance setting two uh, and just, you know, um, vary it a, a, a little bit. Well, the um, best way to regulate that would be how would you look, how would you, you know, judge whether or not it was positive or not? Yes, you can go by symptoms, you can go by palpation, but use a pulse ox, right? Look at the autonomics. I mean, this is the whole presentation that we literally just did is talking about how to understand the autonomic nervous system and how that's going to benefit your patient. Numbers don't lie. Pulse ox isn't going to lie. So you look at that, see if there's any differences with them, um, and then report back and, and base your protocols off of that. That's the best way for you to do that. It's the gold standard in anything. Um, and um, it'll give you, you know, peace of mind for you knowing what you can use for your patients. Yeah, definitely. Um, there's quite a few sort of thank yous and very enjoyables, Eric. So um, I'm, 
this is the next one that Sasha is asking. We can't really get too involved in because um, obviously we have contra specific contraindications. Uh, we don't advocate pointing the laser at the eye. Uh, unless mm -hmm. you know something that I don't, Eric, that she's saying, could cataract be improved? Um, yeah, I don't I know. I, I would be very hesitant to do that. <clears throat> yeah, I don't know of any research, um, and I, I've never used the laser over the eyes just because of that. So now if somebody was blind in an eye, completely blind, or they had deaffrontation of the eye, um, and they gave me written and verbal authorization to try that, maybe, 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 but I, I would never use that on, on a cataracts or any and even like a retinopathy or like any sort of um, pathology of the eye, just because we just don't know. Um, and I would hate to do damage to something if it was an option. So um, I've just stayed away from that. Exactly. You know, as we say, when it comes to things like contraindications, um, obviously um, pretty much, well, every technology that I've ever been aware of always has pregnant women as a contraindication. Um, and, and mostly because nobody's ever carried out a study to prove otherwise. Yeah. With things like that, as a company, we just wouldn't take the uh, wouldn't take the chance. I'm mm -hmm. sure that um, women have been treated who didn't realise that they were pregnant. But as a company, again, that's not something that we would um, we would ever advocate. Which is why you know we provide the uh, the safety glasses uh, with the laser for the patient, just so there is no scatter and and, and any laser gets in the eye. Yeah. Yep. Agreed. Cool, Eric. I think you've had a, probably about twenty thank yous. Very interesting. So that is a very good sign. And again, I know your time is very valuable. Um, and as a company, we very much appreciate your support. And I know you run your clinic in Minneapolis remotely and you have a team across there that run it for you. But all I can say is it's a pleasure dealing with you and, and, and their loss is our gain. <laughs> well, I am grateful to come hang out with you and um, we're, we're having a lot of fun and we're helping a lot of people and that's all what it's all about. So grateful to be over here as well. So thanks for having me and I appreciate everybody on the call today. If there are any questions, please shoot me an email. I'm always open to have conversations and see how I can help you out. Definitely. Chloe in the office will send on a I think, recording of um, of this to any everybody. Um, so any questions come from that, just reply back to Chloe and we can direct them uh, at Dr. Eric. Um, but apart from that, all I've got to say is we, no matter who's delivering the presentations, you know, I think the education is just as important as the actual technology. Um, and we're going to keep delivering the education across the board. Europe's got a fair way to go to catch up with uh, what they're doing with the lasers over in the US. And um, but we're, a, you know, we're a very um, ambitious and driven bunch and give us a couple of years. And um, we want as many patients as possible to be able to um, to, to, to have the, the, the treatment with the laser, uh, as well as your own skill set to try to achieve the best results possible. So, again, Eric, thank you very much. and. Um, we will let everybody go now for their dinner. Lovely. Thanks for having me, Simon. Okay. Take care. Thanks, guys. Cheers. All the best.